Good morning, everyone. Good morning. What a wonderful Sunday morning. Let's stand. Let's sing. We are a part of this beautiful, beautiful church. Let's sing about it. I dream of a church where everyone is welcome. I dream of a place we all can call home. I dream of a world where justice is flowing with hope. Beautiful crowd this morning. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, church. It's good to be home. I enjoyed our time so much in San Jose, California, and my, oh my, did I ever brag about you all while I was gone. Rightfully so. They were all jealous, and they're all ready to pack up and come to Kentucky, and we're going to have more to say about that because they actually are very interested in being a sister church with us. They are so, so thankful for our presence, and and we for theirs. So wouldn't that be neat from Kentucky to California? It's good to be home, Kenny. Thank you and Justin for taking care of things last week. Absolutely. And of you course, Brenda, who's always on it. You know, we, we don't just survive when you're gone. We thrive. I know it. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and to make sure of that, Kenny asked me in the midweek, I said, that was a good sermon. He goes, you actually watch those? I said, you better believe it. <laughs> so John posted him a little extra early when I'm out because he knows I'm just watching. Watching. I think it got posted Sunday last week. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have you here, church. If you're a visitor with us, um, we hope that you will just embrace who we are and what we are and let us embrace you. We feel like you're one of us the second you come here, so welcome. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, let's just take a moment and turn to those closest to you and hug their necks, shake their hands, let them know how delighted you are to see them this morning. Yeah. 
your will is done, oh God, make it so. You sound so wonderful. You can be seated if you'd like. Pastor, a lot of things going on as always. A lot of things going on, Kenny, and we stay busy, and we had a great week this week. We had elders meeting, a council meeting yesterday. We had folks scattered around. We want to thank those who were at Frankfurt Pride, especially Liz and Karen, who were there start to finish and got it all set up. And I know Cadillac was there emceeing and, and had a presence there. But I hear that uh, we weren't able to be there because another dozen of us were here in the sanctuary all morning planning Advent worship. So we were scattered yesterday, but lots of things get done. So thanks to all. Uh, we will have a church growth team this Wednesday at 7. So if you're a part of that, uh, just take a note of that. We'll meet at 7. And then next, is it Sunday or Saturday? I thought uh, I had my calendar. It may be Saturday. Saturday. I think it is Saturday as a matter of fact. Yeah, that's okay. So Saturday, next Saturday at 4 o'clock. How many of y'all seen the movie Spotlight? It is a powerful movie. We're going to watch it here together and we're going to talk about it. And actually, the United Church of Christ has a discussion guide around that. So even if you've seen it, we invite you to come for the movie and then we'll uh, have a bite to eat and discuss that. And then, of course, you already mentioned that last week, BUCC With had a Moorhead. presence in Moorhead. Yesterday, BUCC had a wonderful presence again in Frankfurt at Capital Pride. And of course, we want to thank everyone who was a part of that. As a matter of fact, if you helped with the Pride booth yesterday in Frankfurt, would you stand up so we can see you? And we want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great presence, just it wonderful. It was, and we've already heard lots of great things about that. And now coming up on October the 28th is Georgetown Pride. Liz, I want to let you fill us in on a little bit of the details. <laughs> yes, we are having a Georgetown Pride. Actually, it's on a private property. So um, we will be going to represent again. And also, we will have to be getting more people to sign up. Um, we already have four right now, myself and Karen, and then we have um, Kathy and Maureen. So you can, you can see Liz. For more information on that, it's a, it's a cookout. Sign-up sheets are in the fellowship hall. And then, of course, we sincerely believe that no one should ever be hungry. And that's the reason we have what we call Nosh. No one stays hungry. Food is available after the service on your way out the door. If you need food or if you know someone who does, just stop by and pick that up and take it. It's there to meet that need. And then, of course, we've been doing something lately here at BUCC the last couple of years or so that we call Fifth Sundays at BUCC. The next one is coming up on Sunday, October the 29th. Uh, and we're going to have a fun time, a trunk or treat and a chili supper. And we're going to decorate cars and we're going to eat and we're going to, I don't know, we might sing and we're going to have all kinds of fun. So, Jeremy, you fill us in on that. From 3 to 5 on the 29th, we're going to gather here at the church and uh, have chili, which what better way to spend your Sunday than eating chili, in my opinion, candy. And uh, so bring the children out, break, decorate your trunks, and let's have a good time. It'll be from 3 to 5, and that will give you plenty of time to get downtown for Thriller that starts later that evening. So there's no excuse but to just show up. So full we'll day, see you there. Full day. I'll be in costume. You guys can guess what. <laughs> and I also know that one of our smallest members will be in costume. I'm sure Ray will be too. I saw on Facebook, y'all know I stalk you, right? And I saw Sophie in her owl con costume yesterday and it was so cute. So I responded, that's the cutest owl I know. And so Aaron sat back and said, our theme for our trunk, I love this, who loves you. Jesus. Oh, perfect. Perfect. That raises the bar, doesn't it? Does, it? it does. It does. I love that. What a beautiful family we have. What a beautiful family. Let's sing. God, make it so. This beautiful church, make it so. Make it so. Make it so. So we dream of a world where love reigns among us and your will is done. Oh, 
place we gather with all our differences and you remind us of your call to be one in spirit when that reminder is not easy to hear or to live out you remind us again let's pray together loving creator as we gather together this morning we are thankful for this special time to be in community we pray to listen for your word, to feel your presence, and to draw always closer to each other and to you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning as we sing our opening hymn. It's number 519 in the New Century Hymnal, Not My Brother Nor My Sister. Not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh God, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh God, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, O oh God, standing in the need of prayer. It's me. in the need of prayer not the preacher nor the deacon but it's me oh god standing in the need of prayer not the preacher nor the deacon but it's me oh god standing in the need of prayer it's me it's me oh god standing in the need of stranger nor my neighbor but it's me oh God standing in the need of prayer not the stranger nor my neighbor but it's me oh God standing in the need of prayer it's me it's me oh God standing in the need of prayer it's me be seated. Can I see the kids, please? Uh-oh. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the almost came to church and forgot your doll back there. You had to go back and get her, didn't you? Yeah. That was pretty cool. <laughs> and her bottle. Yeah. And her bottle. That was a really cool thing. Hey, do you all notice anything about this stole that's different? I have, I have lots of stoles in my office. And every Sunday I'm like, hmm, which one am I going to wear? And today I chose this one. What's this look like? Hand prints and little dots. You know who made this for me? A set of triplets. You know what triplets are? I know what triplets Tell are. Tell me. It's three. It's like you, it can be three boys or three girls or a boy, two girls. Or, a boy. <laughs> or a boy. That's right. 
But they're all born sort of at the same time, right? Just minutes apart. So they made these for me, Isabella and Saxon and... You're not helping me. So, but Sabella, Sophia, and Saxon made this for me. Thank you, Brenda, for helping me out. And they brought this by a couple years ago, and I just love it. But the reason I wore it today is because today is known in church as Children's Sabbath. Do you know what that means? Do you know what Sabbath means? Sabbath is a time that people take, supposedly, to rest and to come to church, and to spend time with family, and significant others, and kids, and friends. God wants us to take at least one day a week to just chill. Do you all ever take one day a week to just to chill? No school, no work, no, no chores? Do you ever get a break from your chores at home? You don't have chores? All right. You get a break? You have chores? Do you get a break one day a week? If not, your parents are listening to this right now, okay? <laughs> so God want, God knows the world's real, real busy, and we get tired and all that kind of stuff, and we need rest. And so Children's Sabbath reminds us of the rest, but it also reminds us of you all and how important you all are to our church. And so I want the church to tell you all how important you are. Church, is it important for you to see these kids every Sunday? Yes. And do we love these kids? Yes. And you know what else? Someday, you all may be sitting at an organ or a piano or playing a guitar or working a computer or videoing or doing sound or making communion or preaching or making, bringing donuts to everybody to eat. Someday you all may be leaders. You're going to bring the donuts. Sorry. <laughs> so what I want you all to remember is we look to you all because you all have our future in your hands. And so we want to love you and do all we can to help you because we know it's going to be a great world. You know how we know that? Because you are in it. And we're thankful you're in it. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, Dear God. we are so thankful for all children, and especially for our kids at Bluegrass. Amen. We love you all. We're thankful for you. Go have fun at Kids Church. Jeremy's got you today. I like to add the honor flight. Yay, that's great. That's a perfect thing for the bedroom. That's great. I like it. Chelsea Kenny, get back up there. <laughs> well, it is this time that we that we take out of our worship time. It's important time. In fact, I met with one of our kids this week that's going through confirmation, and we talked about the different parts of worship. And I asked him, I said, do you remember when we do sharing of joys and concerns? Yes. I said, what happens then? He said, people say what they want to pray about. And we talked about how we don't only just pray on this Sunday morning for your joys and concerns, but we carry them with us through the week. Isn't it wonderful to be in a place that is safe and loving that we can share our joys and concerns? So let me open with just a couple. Um, we, of course, want to remember our brothers and sisters in California. Wow, oh wow. We had just a pristine week while we were there. We were at Mere Woods on Sunday afternoon after we left church in San Jose. And I said to Brent, I said, it's just sort of dusty and dry looking. And on the way back through San Francisco, it was bumper to bumper traffic. And then when we uh, got up Monday to catch a flight, we opened the drapes in the hotel and you could just see the smoky orange sky. And we were 25 miles away. Our good friend Marshall McPhee uh, lives in San Elmo, where, where is um, San Francisco Theological Seminary. She, she's teaching, and she has a friend whose fiancé's house burned to the ground and, and other friends who are suffering, and we know we are hearing those stories, so we want to, to be prayerful about those folks. And continuing prayer for the folks in Puerto Rico and Texas and Florida, it has been some kind of two months of 
natural disasters, has it not? So we want to remember them. So church, what other joys and concerns would you like to share this morning? Yes, Stephanie. Uh, I have a few. Um, so one joy is that um, I had an article that I submitted a few months ago, and I found out on Friday that it's going to be published. Yay. Um, Prayers for that, absolutely. Richard. Uh, I have a co-worker, a good friend at work, and um, his father had a really bad stroke about two, two months ago, um, and he's still recovering from that. And last, um, it was just a few days, I can't remember what day it was, but um, his daughter had walked in her house in E-Town and died of a massive heart attack. Mm -hmm. So that family is just really struggling right now. Just ask you to lift up her prayer. His name is Sean Lee. Sean, okay. Wow, that's a lot. Peg? Um, well, I have a, um, a joy that um, uh, actually that my dad is, um, he, he is not afraid of dying. And he... Um, he knows where he's going, and um, he's closer to that now than he was. And um, and so I'm um, I'm celebrating his life with him, and so I'm I'm joyful about that. Um, I have a concern for uh, my mom and my siblings. You know that we're going to miss him. Uh, it, for those of you that don't know, his cancer spread to his bone, and we're um, Wait to see if it's also spread to his brain and, and other organs. He has lung cancer that spread. Um, so I know we've got a, a you know, rough time ahead of us, um, but he's lived an amazing life, and he is he's not afraid, and he is such a role model for my family, and that's joyful for me. Hmm. Um, so I have that joy, and I, I also have a. Um, Concern that uh, my sister and I have a strange relationship, um, but um, I was telling Brenda this morning, you know, I have a constant prayer of uh, God's grace on that relationship as we move forward with this future, and um, that everything that comes out of my sister's mouth, I hear with God's ears. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> We've got your back, Peggy, and when you hear the sermon, you could maybe come up and join me because it's uh, right along those lines. Yeah. 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 I just want to say thanks for the prayers for a very successful Haitian mission trip. Yay. Back, uh, yesterday. So, uh, definitely reboot your system to really appreciate what we have here. Haiti's got 85% unemployment and the poorest. Did y'all hear that? 85% unemployment. Do you get to see your boys? I got to see my boys. Yay. In fact, uh, one of them, uh, one of them took a Facebook photo and actually Skyped me and said, Hey, you know, I'm Get ready, bluegrass. I'm just going to leave it at that. Get ready. Yeah, Liz.
those who walk through because they're very reminded. Um, stage, he's in stage three right now. And just continue first. Absolutely. Steven. Continually to keep you in prayer about that. Yeah, Greg, then I'll get you, Rita. Absolutely. Thank you. Rita? Um, I just wanted to thank you and the city council for the leadership on the charter for compassion. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that. And uh, we are really excited about this initiative, uh, Compassionate Cities. We were thrilled to have Reverend Dr. Joan Brown Campbell, the former director of religion at Chautauqua Institute. She is a new resident here. She recently married Dr. Albert Pennybaker. And so uh, he's a long time. Um, man of uh, such uh, respect and stature. Uh, he used to be the chair of National Council on Churches. And so anyway, Joan and Penny live there in the library where our Raj used to live. And I called them and said, any chance you'd come to the council meeting? And they said, absolutely. So this Charter for Compassion, if you will go to Facebook and like the, the page Compassionate Lexington uh, and just sort of stay tuned, I think it's really going to be meaningful for our cities. And I will tell you that... Um, I, uh, I, I'm sort of a co-moderator of this group and have been, it's been my honor to do that. Um, but one of the things I said is for, that, for this to work in Lexington, for us truly to make ourselves a compassionate city, we've got to come together across our political divides, across our culture divides, our racial divides, our divides of how we define family and of our religious. And I am thrilled, can't quite announce it yet, but let me just say this. The largest church in Lexington, which is fairly, very conservative and very different from us, are all about it and are ready to sign on. And I think when we get that happen, and I can't wait for the day when bluegrass folks are standing with those churches and we, and I, what I've said is, surely to goodness we can come together in the, in the issue of kindness and compassion to one another in such a divided world. So Rita, thanks for bringing that up. Karen, yeah. We'll keep you in prayer. I know it's hard when you're hurting and also you have a job thing. Daniel? I'm, um, I'm going to be traveling to uh, Morgan today. Um, I'll be there tomorrow. We are um, doing an interprofessional trip with um, the College of Industry. They're hoping to basically a pop-up dental clinic. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be serving um, kids at a uh, school that has the majority of um, kids receiving free and reduced lunch. So just pray for that trip and the kids will be serving Absolutely. I know you will. Yeah. I have a, a, I need prayers for a niece that um, has came forward and said she needs help with an addiction. But I mostly, I want prayers for that, of course, but I want prayers for her kids that have been displaced again. Mm -hmm. um, Pre-teen boy, a teenage boy and a pre-teen little girl. Wow. That's tough. It's really tough. We're going to lift them in prayer. 
Let's prepare our hearts for her. I do have one joy before we do that. Donna Martin, it is good to see you, my friend. Donna and Andrea were members here at, way back in the day. Some really of our founders, they moved to Florida. They come here when they can, but guess what? They're moving back. <clears throat> so I know you'll get to know them, those of you who are new. A lot of new folks here, huh, Donna? Yeah. yeah. So, it's, so we're thrilled to have you, and we look forward to you all being back at your church home. They've always stayed in touch with us, always. We haven't taken them off Simple Church or Facebook. Or, no, we don't matter where we go. We're still members of Bluegrass, so we're thrilled to have you back. Let's prepare our hearts for prayer. In the midst of pain, I choose love. In the midst of war, I choose peace. When my world falls down, explanations can't be found. I will climb to holy ground, I will rise, I choose love. God, we come to you just as we are, knowing that you love us and and that you call us to love others, you do call us to choose love, and sometimes that is so hard to do. So in those situations in our life, when we're finding it hard to reconcile, we're, we're troubled and divided, we ask, oh God, that you intercede. And you're, we're reminded by our good friend Peggy that sometimes we just have to start listening with your ears and seeing with your eyes. So we can get through. We are so thankful for this church family at Bluegrass. For the authenticity and the care and the genuine love that we have for one another. God, you birthed us seven years ago and you've been with us every step of the way. And so we ask that you just continue to walk with us. And don't let us get complacent, God. Give us courage and stamina to follow your vision. For we know our world needs places of worship that are inclusive and loving and give an interpretation of the gospel that perhaps might be a bit different than exclusive messages and decisions about who's in and who's out. God, help us recognize that witness that we give to our community. We're thankful for those who continue to reach out on behalf of our church. And God, we just ask you continue to give us opportunities. And then we know it's up to us to take hold of those. Oh God, in our church family, we have so many concerns. We, we have joys and we don't want to ever forget the joys. The joys of successes in careers. We're thankful for Stephanie and that her articles published. She worked so hard. We're thankful for the successful mission in Haiti. And God help us remember those people, the poorest country in the world. God, we've lifted up our concerns and we continue to lift up Peggy and her dad and her family. And as Peggy juggles this tension between joy and celebration that her daddy, Ted, is, is ready to go to his eternal home, we also know what a burden it is on, on Peggy, not in a negative way, but just to take care of her mom and her dad. And God, we don't forget that Peggy herself is battling cancer. So 
So wrap your arms around her and her family, and especially Ted. May they know your love and your presence in the difficult days ahead. We pray for our brothers and sisters in California and Puerto Rico and Texas and Florida. And don't let us just say that flippantly, but let us remember they are our brothers and sisters. Continue to give us ways that we can help even from a distance. God, we pray you'll be with Austin and Steph as they are pursuing things in their careers. We pray you be with Richard's co-worker, Sean, who's had a tough, tough load. A father with a stroke and a daughter who died unexpectedly. God, just, just let Sean know your love. We pray for Liz's cousin's husband, David, for Stephen's friend, for the family of Greg's friend, James Stout. We're assured of his presence with you, God, but we know that his family is grieving this unexpected loss. So we pray for Karen and, and for others who are out of work, who are unemployed or underemployed, facing financial strain. May they find opportunities in a really tough market. We give thanks for Daniel and for his work mission of sorts to Moorhead and for those kids that will be touched by this dental clinic. We pray for Maureen and Kathy's niece for that addiction that she fights and for those precious kids who are at a really tough age in their life anyway and now they're displaced. God, we know how addiction has just taken hold of our country. And we know it's tough. So we pray, God, that whatever our addictions are, and we all have them in some way, you give us strength and clarity to overcome. God, Kenny and I as pastors of this congregation, we, we get calls and texts and emails and Facebook messages all week, all hours of the day and night with heavy things that our folks are carrying that they don't really want to share. But we know their hearts are hurting. Their minds are confused. There's doubts. There's questions of why. And so just now, we pray for those unspoken needs. And we also, each one of us, lift up our own prayer. Just now. We love you, God. And we're so thankful you love us. Amen. In the midst of pain, I choose love. In the midst of war, I choose peace. When my world falls down, explanations can't be found. I will climb to holy ground, I will rise, I choose love. A reading from Philippians chapter 4. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and miss, who are my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord. Loved ones, I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche to come to an agreement in the Lord. 
Yes, and I'm also asking you, loyal friend, to help these women who have struggled together with me in the ministry of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the scroll of life. Be glad in the Lord always. Again I say, be glad. Let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things, all that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. Practice these things, whatever you learned, received, heard, or saw in us. The God of peace will be with you. If you run in preacher or seminarian circles as I have done these past 11 years or so, wow, that seems like a long time. But if you hang out in these circles, it doesn't take long to realize that the Apostle Paul is one of the most controversial writers of Scripture that we have. Only in truth, let me remind us that Paul never intended to be a writer of Scripture. What we have that comprises 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament are not writings from Paul intended for us. But rather, as my former New Testament professor and scholar Jerry Sumney repeatedly reminded us as students, any and all writings attributed to Paul are at best intercepted mail from Paul to one of the churches he founded, and at worst, not even penned by Paul in the first place. Paul's writings... Remembering again that we're reading snippets or interpretations of his intercepted mail. Paul's writings are much like other scripture. Folks tend to pick out a scripture or so and use them to support their beliefs or theology. Now in preacher terms, that's called proof texting. Pulling a scripture out of context and seemingly picking it out of the air to prove one's belief. Those of us who do not claim to take the Bible literally, and I do not, can still be guilty of proof texting. We complain when folks use scripture against us, and then sometimes we turn around and do the same thing. So it's a slippery slope, and sometimes we're not real good staying away from the chairlift that delivers us squarely in the middle of that slippery slope of proof texting. My friends, today's scripture reading is very rich, full of angles. So I'll do my best to focus on just a few of the many lessons that we might learn from Paul's mail. First, let's set the context. It's always important to do this, but especially with this fragment of one of Paul's letters. So, so Paul is writing this letter to one of his favorite churches, the church at Philippi. Only Paul is no longer present with them. He is in jail. He still hears about how things are going, and what he hears is that things aren't going so well. We can conclude that much in the second verse. It's obvious that two leaders of the church, and Deb pronounced them much better than I will. So Deb, tell us again who those two leaders were. Thank you. Euodia and Syntyche. I had Brenda scheduled to read the scripture, but I knew she would not be happy with me. So I had Deb punt for us. Those two women aren't getting along. And Paul is urging them to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now let me pause here just a bit and tell you, this is my favorite verse in the New Testament. 
You know my favorite in the Old Testament is Micah 6, 8. But I love this in the New Testament. Before how many times have I heard that women are supposed to stay silent in the church? And how many churches still confine their female members to church kitchens and Sunday school rooms? Not welcoming them as elders or pastors. And I love it when people refer to their standing on that. They reference their refusal for women leadership not being in the church to 1 Corinthians 14.34. So I ask them, well, which is it? You claim that Paul writes for women to keep silent in 1 Corinthians, but here in Philippians, Paul is clearly referring to not one, but two women who are leading the church at Philippi. Just one more example of why we can't take the Bible literally. Well, it's unfortunate though that right as we are legitimizing the role of women all the way back to the earliest churches, they seem to be disagreeing. I for one wish these women could enjoy just a little bit of positive press before it all fell apart so quickly. Before Paul called their arguing out. But you see friends, Paul didn't have time to mince words. He was in prison, pretty sure he would never get out. This church at Philippi had founded what was once a beacon of light and had been a wonderful witness against the political teachings of the oppressive and unjust Roman government. Paul had given much of his life's ministry to this church, and now that he was away, conflicts were happening fast. So Paul's intent was to nip the bickering and to remind them who they were and whose they were. Notice then how Paul begins. After calling out this conflict that's present, Paul also gives thanks for the ministry of these women and of the other leaders who he says their names are in the book of life. For Paul... That meant that they would experience God in eternity. Ooh. Now that's a breath of fresh air. Even with our faults and disagreements and sometimes ugliness with one another, God still claims us and names us. And I don't know about you, but I can say a loud amen to that. Amen. Paul thanks these leaders for their service and then he reminds them to take a deep breath, so to speak. He says, rejoice. Hmm. That's what we all do when we're embroiled in personal conflicts or church division or political unrest or society injustice or life challenges in general, isn't it? Rejoice. Yeah, right. Maybe that's why Paul repeated these words. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. When I write these sermons, I'm mindful of what's going on in our church family and in the world. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Well, tell that to someone who just received a terminal diagnosis for them or someone they love. Tell it to someone praying that a deposit will clear the bank before the check will. Tell it to someone who reads Facebook posts of others' busy lives as they yearn for something to do and companionship. Rejoice. Just tell that to someone still in the throes of grief, uncertainty, confusion. Paul's mail to the Philippians gives us another lesson in how or why we might be so bold to ask someone to rejoice or to rejoice ourselves. The Lord is near. Have you ever experienced the nearness of God? Think on that for just a minute.
I am so grateful that I have experienced the nearness of God many, many times. And, and I'm counting on God to continue to show up in my life. Paul reminds his listeners and us that God is near. And because God is near, we shouldn't worry. Ah, oh, now wait just a minute. I know you're saying. Paul asks us to rejoice and now don't worry. What gives? Well, keep reading with me. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and those requests will be granted. It doesn't end like that, does it? I completely changed Paul's letter. Paul's instruction is to pray. In other words, to find that connection with God, to, to be as, as present with God as we want God to be present with us. It's easy to say that God isn't present with us when we aren't doing our share of the communication. God needs us and wants us to be still, to be authentic, to be willing to make our relationship with God a priority, not a Hail Mary in the heat of a storm. Now the good news is that, that God will be with us in those Hail Mary times as well. But if we really desire a relationship with God, we have to be willing to do our part. Paul tells us to pray, to make our requests known, but... My brothers and sisters, Paul doesn't guarantee that the request will be filled like the list we give to one another. What do, Paul does claim is that we will receive every time God's peace. God's peace in spite of what we're going through. Now, I don't know about you, but it's been my experience that even peace doesn't come quickly as I'd like it to. Yet again, that's probably more my doing than God's. I want peace immediately about a situation. But, but we all know, those of us who face some tough times, we know, don't we, that peace is a process. And internal peace, well, that process can take a bit. When I pray with folks going through illness or death, relationship crisis, financial concerns, breakdowns of friendships, conflicts even in church and even where I might be concerned, my prayer is for peace. And remember, my prayer is to remember that God is near. And I don't believe that God takes sides in our conflicts. So oftentimes, peace is either found with reconciliation or letting go. Paul's call to these leaders was to be reconciled. But we never hear if that happened. Which is perhaps why Paul followed that wish of reconciliation with a call for their praying and a quest for peace that passes understanding. Before Paul leaves this section of the letter, and he's just getting started with the Philippians, he gives a few more instructions. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellent and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Well, there it is. Getting along with one another, inside or outside the church, there it is. It's as simple as that. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, 
If there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Simple, huh? Let's be real honest. And you who are really focused on grammar, excuse me here, but it ain't simple. Who's to judge what is true or honorable or just or pleasing or commendable? Left to us, it would only make our arguments more intense. That's why Paul continued in a way that really makes it clear. Paul says to the Philippians and perhaps to us, keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. In Paul, that is. Perhaps Paul shared with them his history of persecuting Christians in the worst way. And so what they received and heard and saw in Paul was remorse and forgiveness of himself. Perhaps they received Paul as a man whose mind and heart had been changed in extraordinary ways. A man admitting and willing to admit that he was wrong. And committing his life to correcting all that was within his control. A man whose life was transformed from one of the cruelest persecutors of the early Christians. To someone who was willing to die for his belief. And they saw from Paul. A man willing to go to jail more than once. A man who committed his whole life to ministry in spite of what others would think about him or, or question his reasoning for changing course so late in life. Friends, what they saw in Paul was a man who found peace with the what is. Which found him behind bars for the sake of the gospel. Here are a few more things that the Philippians might have heard from Paul. Paul gave a lot of advice. Some of it conflicting about everything from marriage to neighbors to how to be church. But what he gave the most advice about was how to deal with conflict. I suppose Paul knew what we do. That having conflict is inevitable. And solving conflict is a choice. Most of all, what Paul's churches, including the one at Philippi, heard and saw and received and learned was that if we want to know, if we really want to know what is true or honorable or just or pleasing or commendable, then we look no further than the example of Jesus. It's a simple example to follow, but it's not an easy one. It took Paul a while, but he finally got it. He saw something in this prophet and rabbi named Jesus that, that called Paul to make a complete transformation in his life. Jesus, who forgave when he had every reason not to, who loved in spite of hate that was spewed at him, who welcomed them all to God's grace and extended that grace to the least deserving. Truth. Honor, just, pleasing, commendable. With God's help, may we each find our way to at least being on that journey. And perhaps we might even travel a part of it side by side together. Perhaps. I don't know how many we have here in worship this morning, 75, 80 or so. But here's what I do know. I know that we all got here from different paths. And I know we all bring different things to this time of communion. 
Friends, this is a time for us to take to just sort of settle in a bit. A time for us to really be real with who we are and what's going on in our life and ask for God's direction. They asked me last week in San Jose, because normal United Church of Christ congregations do communion once a month. And they said, how come you do that every weekend? How do you get by with that? Well, that was sort of a joke when they said that part. <laughs> so when you start a church, you just get to do some things. But I said to them, here's just a couple of reasons. One is that I just feel like we need to be reminded pretty often who God is and, and who we are. And if someone misses a Sunday and has to wait another month, another two months, I don't want that to be the case. I'm reminded of Children's Sabbath of little Isabel running up here with her doll for Children's Moment. And I hope that figuratively we run to this table and we say, God, help us out. Give us that peace that passes understanding. May it be so. we come here to your table of love and grace and hope and peace and we know that you invite us to come just as we are that we are all loved and claimed and welcomed we pray that in this bread and this cup we will sense your presence and that somehow just the crumb and a sip can give us the strength and the courage to continue carrying on. We remember that life of Jesus who taught us what was just and pure and right and commendable. And we need strength and courage to follow that example. And we remember how he taught us to pray as we will sing that together. Say 
Before Paul, when Paul was outside, perhaps waiting on the disciples and their families to come out, Jesus gathered with his followers and their families in that room that would be the last time he would have supper with them. And in that room were people who were scared and confused who were already starting their grieving about the loss of their friend and their Messiah, Jesus. And in that room were people who disagreed. Can you imagine how angry some of them were that one had betrayed Jesus and one had doubted Jesus? Can you imagine the conflicts among those folks? So Jesus thought that it would be a time to take bread and to, and to bless it. So he did, and then he broke it. And he gave it to them. And he said, take and eat. I have lived my life for you. And now I will give my life for you. After supper, as was his Jewish custom, Jesus took the cup. And he blessed the cup and he said, This cup is a sign of a new covenant that I'm making to you. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. I will always be with you. And he said, Every time you eat and drink, I want you to remember my life. And I want you to remember my presence with you. This morning, friends, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, no matter where you are on your faith journey, perhaps you're as secure as you've ever been and perhaps you have questions that you have no answers for, doubts within you. Maybe this is the first time you've taken communion. Maybe you grew up in a denomination like me that you had to be pretty clear to perfect before you took communion. But we know that people gathered in that room that night were far from perfect. So you're invited to take a piece of bread, and we also have some gluten-free on the, on the trays. You're invited to take a piece of bread, and then after a time of meditation, to drink from the cup. In that prayerful time, it is my prayer that you sense hope and peace in your life.
we prepare to take our offering, I want to share a couple things with you that we received in the mail, both from our um, United Church of Christ uh, conference. Thank you to the members of Bluegrass United Church of Christ for being a 5 for 5 congregation of the United Church of Christ in 2006. 5 for 5 congregations support our church's wider mission, Neighbors in Need, One Great Hour of Sharing, Christmas Fun, and Strengthen the Church Special Mission Offerings of the United Church of Christ. And this is a certificate for our giving. Since our inception, we have been a five for five church, which is not always easy, especially for a small church. It'd be easy for us to say, oh, things are a little tight, so we're going to not pay that. But we're in covenant with the wider United Church of Christ community, and part of that covenant is to support our brothers and sisters across, remembering that they supported us in getting launched with grants and different things. So we should remember that and continue to give. Let us pray for our offering. God, help us see our, our giving as an opportunity to be part of something bigger than us. And it's hard sometimes. Things are tight sometimes. Yet help us remember that our church is important and we want this witness to continue in our community. You know our hearts and you know our talents. So direct our giving in ways that we can. Whether that be with our financial resources, our talents, our commitment and energy, our time that we give. All we ask, oh God, is that you bless these gifts. Knowing that we give them with grateful hearts. For the purpose of making your world and indeed our little part of the world a better place. Amen. Amen. church in the 80s when this was a contemporary song. Kenny and I were talking about this morning, Pass It On. Do y'all remember that song? Mm -hmm. It only takes a spark. So we're going to sing that as we, 
as we end our time together this morning. And perhaps you've been thinking about joining our church. If you'd like to do so, it's really just as simple as you coming forward and sharing with me that you'd like to be a part of our church family to make that official. And we will welcome you with open arms. So if that's uh, your desire, join me as we sing this closing hymn. and sisters as we leave this place that is what it's all about going out into the world and passing on the love of God the grace of God the forgiveness of God the mercy of God <laughs> even when it's cloudy and stormy and tough literally and figuratively may we go pass it on Amen Send forth by God's blessing our true faith confessing the people of God from this dwelling take leave the service is ended oh now be extended the fruits of our worship in all who believe the seed of the teaching receive shall blossom in actions for God and for all. God's grace did invite us and love shall unite us to work for God's realm and to answer the call. Be blessed.